an example system, no, then talk about one, functional it? safety. Um, we'll talk a bit about evaluating the hazards and assigning safety integrity levels, so on and so forth. And we'll, we'll come up eventually with a bit of a conclusion as to whether we've achieved a lap or not. So um, this is us, Six Engineering. We're, uh, we work worldwide. We've got a few offices dotted about, mostly sort of remote things that we do. Um, but we specialise in functional safety, uh, process safety, and uh, cybersecurity for operational technology. So that's not your um, that's not your um, antivirus system or anything like that. This is uh, stopping people messing up your process plant, either deliberately or, or otherwise. Uh, a disclaimer, um, I've had to add this in because uh, I got a bit of a warning of somebody saying you, you need to have one. So there we go. Somebody can read it at their own measure. Uh, so this is me. Uh, I, I may have aged a little bit since then, just a little. Um, I've been working for the past 10 years in process and technical safety. Uh, I've worked in a variety of industries. I do a lot of work in oil and gas and, uh, and more so nowadays in, in the chemicals industry as well. And you'll notice there that there's a TUV Rhineland uh, bit of text. Um, I've done a functional safety engineers course and passed an exam to say that I'm a functional safety engineer. So um, I should should know what I'm talking about. So achieving the LARP with safety instrumented systems. What is a LARP? And what are safety instrumented like systems? So we'll go through what is a LARP next. So I want to take you right back to what the law says and to the Health and Safety at Work it's 1974. And in section two, the general duties of employers to their employees. There's quite a lot of talk about so far as is reasonably practicable. Uh, and it's all about managing risk and, and keeping people safe. So there's, there's a legal requirement to do this. But, but how does that actually translate into the design of a process plant? So, in the um, guidance from the Health and Safety Executive, uh, R2P2, uh, which is reducing risk and protecting people, you'll find this LARP triangle. And um, what we need to do as engineers is understand the numbers behind it. So, what the HSE is saying is that if the risk of fatality per annum is greater than one in a thousand, it's intolerable and you must reduce the risk. If it's below one in a million, 10 to the minus six, then it's broadly acceptable. And if there is additional risk reduction that can easily be achieved, then you should implement it. Uh, but otherwise, you're probably going to get left alone if you're down at that level and, and things are uh, adequately safe. It's the bit in the middle that really what we need to talk about, and, and that is anything between one in a thousand to one in a million. And we call this um, TIF alarm tolerable if if the risk is reduced to as low as reasonably practicable. And, and there's a balance to be struck in there about how much we spend on the design um, of, of a piece of plan and how much we reduce the risk to. Um, there is an exception to this 10 to the minus three rule and that is for specific categories where risk can't be reduced. So what you'll find is that helicopter pilots that, that uh, fly to offshore installations their risk is, is something in the region of 10 to the minus two. But there's pretty much nothing you can do about it. So it is what it is. So there are some rules that are uh, set around the LARP, a bit of sort of ground rules. You can't use a LARP to argue about not implementing relevant good practice. So if the HSE have issued an approved code of practice, or there is an industry standard there that says that this is what you should do, then, then it's it's not an argument to say that um, it's not reasonably practical for us to, to implement that. You can't use it, they won't accept it. Um, and a cost benefit analysis alone cannot form the sole argument of a large decision. It doesn't say what else that you should use, but you can't just use cost benefit analysis. So a lot really is for circumstances where Either you established good practice, so there's doesn't exist or is out of date. So maybe there's no approved code of practice, or perhaps the industry standards are 30 years old or something like that. Or the situation is quite complex and the relevance of individual good practices is questionable. So can we foresee, for example, individual hazards all coming together to, to create one large 
hazard. So is it reasonably foreseeable? If it's not, then, then we can use allow for, for that argument. If, if it is reasonably foreseeable, we go back to the approved codes of practice for the individual hazards and, and the industry standards and, and we go from there. So I'd like to tell you a bit of story. So I hope you're all sitting comfortably and I shall begin. So once upon a time, there was a process plant and it was designed for a specific set of process variables such as pressure, temperature, gas liquid ratio, flow rate, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And then somebody planned a modification. And so due diligence was done. First, there was a HAZOP and that HAZOP identified that deviations from the design intent were there. Um, so it could do something other than what we wanted it to do. And these deviations could result in fatalities. So we've established a risk profile now. Um, and then it was determined that actually, you know, they, this was a significant risk. And so there was a lot of risk reduction required. It could occur quite, quite frequently. So the design team looked at some different options. They all had their own pros and cons. And they looked at an approach and said, that's the one we're going to go with. And we're going to evaluate it using layer of protection analysis. So we're going to look at the um, cause frequencies and failure frequencies of the safeguards and we're going to compare it to what we think is tolerable and we decided that um, one aspect of this approach of, of reducing the risk we're going to use a safety instrumented system and it's going to have a safety integrity level of SIL1 and then the plant manager lived happily ever after the end or, or perhaps not perhaps there's more to the story that we need to look at yeah. and that's what I'm going to take you through so this is an example system it's not being designed very well, it just is what it is, and uh, and we're going to modify it. So perhaps it was okay for what it was originally designed for, but we're going to change it. So we have a, a two-stage separator system, and the first stage separator is rated for 50 bar, and we're going to assume that our feed comes in at slightly less than 50 bar, so it's okay. But our second stage separator is only rated for 10 bar G. And if the level drops below, um, but stops too low in the first stage separator, we're going to get something called gas blow by that goes into the second stage separator. And so all of a sudden, instead of it being operating at less than 10 bar G, it could be operating at 50. Um, and if it's only designed for 10, the likelihood is, is that it's, it's going to catastrophically fail. And this is what causes your fatalities. So Everybody will have probably seen a risk matrix, usually they're five by five, but I've gone for a, a six by five one here just to, to demonstrate that there is some risk reduction right at the bottom end. So some everywhere has, has similar things to this. And what we do is we, we do our HAZOP, we identify our deviations from the process intent. We say how many people can be affected by this? How often can it happen? And, and that's our risk profile. And you can see that in the top right hand corner, there's lots of red squares. The risk there is intolerable. Um, the yellow squares is tolerable if a LARP, and the green squares is broadly acceptable and additional risk reduction should be considered where it's simple and low cost. So an example has a worksheet for looking at that separator. So our node, our section of plant that we're interested in is the first and second stage separators. We're going to feed in reservoir fluids. We've got some details there about the uh, the process parameters. Um, we've got a bit of detail on notes there about the uh, the design pressures of the different separators, and we've identified that less level less or low level in your um, in your first stage separator can have some severe consequences. And we we found out where it was on using our risk matrix, and then we said that actually there needs to be some risk reduction here. Um, and it needs to get done quickly. So where are we at? Um, well, we said in our HAZOP, I'll we'll just go back again, um, there's potential for up to four fatalities perhaps. So four to 10 fatalities is line D here. And we said, again, just nipping back to the HAZOP, we said that the uh, the frequency of this was, was category six, which is between one in 10 years and one in 100 years. And when you think about how long a plant is operational for, um, that's within a plant lifetime quite easily. So we could have four to 10 fatalities from one particular hazard within a plant lifetime. 
and, and that's not tolerable. We need to reduce the risk. And we need, we need to reduce the risk right down to a tolerable level. And we're going to go with once in 100,000 years here. So we've got a risk reduction factor of 10,000 that we need to achieve, which is quite significant. So in our story, we said that the, uh, the engineering team looked at some different solutions and there was pros and cons to each and the likelihood that you could have a bursting disc and that gives a risk reduction factor of 100 approximately. We could have a pressure relief valve and that does a similar thing or we can have a safety instrumented system and that offers up to 100,000 risk reduction. But there's pros and cons with each and say for a bursting disc, for example, it's a single use item. As soon as it bursts, that's it. You can't just restart your plant. Um, you've, you've got no pressure containment. There. For a pressure relief valve, it, uh, it will lift at the required pressure and it should, should reseat. Um, requires periodic inspection and maintenance and that's probably something that we'll consider. For a safety instrumented system, it can provide reliable protection and, and it's, it's usable as many times as you need it. Um, so there is a, a caveat with that, of course. Uh, it's an active device, but it requires periodic inspection, maintenance, testing, and and functional safety is uh, is very paperwork heavy. It's all about being able to prove that you've got sufficient risk reduction. So what's probably going to happen is we're going to have a couple of different options in there and combine them. And in fact, that's what we've done. So we have two different bits of kit here. So first of all, we've got a pressure relief valve on the second stage separator. And by no means, I'm saying if you're going to design a system design, this is just an example. And we're going to have a single emergency shutdown valve with its own separate um, sensor and transmitter and accelerated logic solver. And that's going to protect our high pressure, low pressure interface. So we've got two items in there. And what we're going to do is we're going to evaluate this, this um, proposed solution. And we're going to do that using LOPA, which is layer of protection analysis. So as you can see, we've got up to five fatalities. We did say four and a half, but that's me making a mistake. Um, we've got one initiating cause, and that's level control valve on the liquid line of the first stage separator. It's open more than required. Level drops down, gas blow-by occurs, overpressured our vessel, kills several people. We've got a couple of safeguards. Start with safeguard two, because that's the pressure relief valve. And we're going to claim 100 risk reduction for that. But safeguard one, we haven't credited yet. And the reason why we haven't credited it is because I want to know what the target is. How good does it need to be? So we're going to install our new low, low level trip. And that's going to shut our valve when the level in the second, in the first stage separator is too low. And we do some sums. And at the end of it, we get a risk reduction factor of 100, which is the top end of SIL 1. So I've introduced a couple of terms here for safety instrumented system and risk reduction factor and SIL. So I'm going to take you through what those are as well. So risk reduction factor, safety integrity level, so how they're related to each other. Um, a risk reduction factor of between 10 and up to 100 is SIL 1. 100 to 1,000, SIL 2, and so on and so forth. And our target is SIL 1. And you can see that as we're, our risk reduction factor is 100, we're right at the top end and we're borderline SIL 2. So what is SIL itself? So SIL is all about um, unavailability of a system. So what you want to know is if I've got a protection system in place, how often will it not protect me when I need it? So we're looking at unavailability. So you can see there that there's a risk reduction factor between 10 and 100. And the average probability of failure on demand, which is essentially the unavailability of the system, needs to be between 1 in 10 and 1 in 100 for SIL 1. So there is some relevant good practice, which our design can follow. Um, there's BSEN 61508. Um, there's BSEN 61511. And 61511 is really for the process industry sector. So a lot of you should be should be familiar with that. 61508 is more for designers, but it is the parent standard. And so it's quite important that we ensure that we, we get the relevant parts of that. 
and, uh, and include them in our design. There's also this bottom recommendation, which is NAMO recommendation NE43, and this is really for analog systems, analog measurement systems. Um, and there's some really good practice in there that our, our recommend is, is followed. Um, it's not largely relevant to what we're doing at the moment, but it's, it's something that I think you should know about, so I've included it. So what is a safety instrumented system? Well, it's designed to detect a hazardous process variable. It can be electrical, electronic, it can be programmable electronic. It's made up of one or more safety instrumented functions. So um, generally these are referred to as trips on a process plant, and you can have at least one in a safety instrumented system. Um, the programmable logic solvers might be microprocessor based, and you can program them, and they're usually known as nodes. Um, you can use relays instead to execute the logic, and uh, that's, a, that's a bit of old technology, but you do you do find it quite frequently. Um, some use a switch to send a signal that a trip point has passed, so it's a digital signal, it's either on or it's off. Some use an analog signal, and, and that's related to the E43 that I just mentioned. So really that's that's looking at a 4 to 20 milliamp signal that's looking at a variable, a process variable. Um, what they all tend to do is they take an action. That might be to move the valve and put the process in a place in a safe state. It might be to alert your operator to then take some action, or it may be, say, to open a relay and trip pump, but it always does something. Um, and you can use it to fill a risk reduction gap. And if you design it properly, there is a quantum of risk reduction that can be formally assigned to it. And our quantum of risk reduction in this case is, is 100. So, that's what we need to design our system to be at least as good as as providing that capability. What it does require is formal ongoing management and testing. It's not something that you can fit and forget. So what does our safety instrumented system look like? In, in this case, there's only one safety instrumented function within it, and that is our low, low level trip, which shuts a valve. And if you look at the architecture in the reliability block diagram at the moment, I'm a big fan of these. I think they really clearly explain what's going on. So we have a level sensor and transmitter that goes into a cabinet somewhere through an intrinsically safe barrier. We have a logic solver, which does the number crunching and uh, is the brain of the system. It makes the decision that the level is too low based on what it's detecting, and it needs to send out a signal to shut a valve which it does through another intrinsically safe barrier. It trips the uh, emergency shutdown um, solenoid valve, which then lets the valve close. Um, that's a one out of one system or what we would call a simplex architecture. There are others. So I wanted to have a little bit of a chat about the functional safety life cycle because we are talking about functional safety. And just to point out where we are in the overall life cycle and what the other parts of the life cycle are. So we've done our hazard and risk assessment. That was our hazard. We've allocated safety functions to protection layers, which was our LOPA. Um, somebody from that should have provided us with a safety requirement specification. We've sort of not talked about that. It's a bit more in detail. But where we're at is we're at number four there, box four. So design and engineering of a safety instrumented system. But what we've also got is design and development of other means of risk reduction. So that means that because we are taking a risk reduction credit for that relief valve that we're going to put on second stage separated, that means that it needs to be properly designed, as, as it should be anyway, but it needs to be properly designed and documented and inspected and maintained as appropriate. And, and that needs to be managed. That again can't be fit and forget. So that's where we are in the overall life cycle. You can see there that there's, there's a few other boxes. Um, so it needs management, it needs assessment, it needs auditing, there's a bit of planning and whatever you required and verification. So they're the other things that are within functional safety. So your safety requirement specification is a big long list of what this safety instrumented function, this new low level trip that we're going to put in, 
is what it needs to achieve. And if you look at clause 10 of standard BSEN 61511 part one, um, it lists 29 separate requirements. So there's a lot that goes on and needs to be considered for this. And these are all things that either says what it needs to do or how fast it needs to do it or how good it needs to be or what are the things that we've taken into account such as the location and the environment and the dust and the vibration. So physical effects like that that may have an effect upon the operation of the system so it may reduce its efficacy. So as you'd expect with any engineering stuff, there's some maths involved. And these are the simplified cell calculation formula. And you can see that with, for the architecture of one out of one, which is a simplex loop, there's um, a quite simple formula. And it's half times the dangerous failure rate times the test interval. Now, these are simplified formulae. And if you look in standard BSEN 61508 part six, you'll find some rather more complicated formulae as well. But these are the simple ones. And what I find is that if you do your calculation based on the simple one with generic failure rate data, you won't go far wrong. It gets a bit more complicated than that, but that's the first pass that I would recommend. What I would say is that it's very common to find failure rates of instrumentation, and other equipment that you need, uh, rather than in failures per year, something like that, they'll be expressed as failures in time, which is failures per billion hours. So you've got to be very careful that when you are doing your calculations and say your dangerous failure rate is in terms of years that you need to use, then obviously there's, there's a bit of manipulation that needs to go on here. When we're talking about SIL, there's sort of two sides to it. There's the unavailability, which is the probability of failure on demand, but there's also the hardware fault tolerance. So this is that a random fault within the system takes out our system. So how good does our system need to be to be able to um, tolerate random faults? And that's dependent on the SIL rating and whether we've got a high demand mode or a low demand mode. And we've got continuous there and continuous is the same as high demand mode. But what, you, what you'll find when you look at the standard is that if the demand is more frequent than once per year, then the dangerous failure rate that we need to use is in terms of failures per hour. Whereas if it's a low demand mode, once per year or less, then it's in terms of average probability of failure on demand. Where it does come in is for your hardware fault tolerance. So, um, the more redundancy you have, the better hardware fault tolerance you have, but the more kit you've got, the more likely something is to go wrong. So again, there's always a balance to be struck. What we're particularly interested in is the safe failure fraction. And the safe failure fraction is um, out of all the different ways that a piece of equipment can fail, um, how many of those, what proportion of those are safe. Um, and there's, Two types of component, type A and type B. And with type A, all the failure mechanisms are known, and that's switches, relays, valves, things that are really simple. Type B is anything that's programmable, pretty much. If you can put some programming into it, it's a type B. And this this all impacts on the design of our system. We're not going to look at this at the moment. We're at SIL 1. There's no redundancy required, so it doesn't really matter for us. But I just wanted to include it so that you're aware of it because it gets missed a lot. Um, we're looking at hardware fault tolerance sill, got some safe failure fractions. We're at sill one. We don't need any hardware fault tolerance. There's no particular issue with safe failure fraction either. So what we do need to do is a calculation to show that we've achieved what we needed to achieve. And um, I've given you an example here, and this is using some level instrumentation, a programmable logic solver, and then some standard kit that you find on site. Uh, so this is an actual example of something that we've done for someone. And uh, what we can see is at the top, we've got our chosen test interval. And this is 
it's to be chosen by us as the designer of what the testing mode is. And I wouldn't recommend that anybody goes for a two months testing mode because it's really paperwork heavy. But as it happened, because this is based on a, a real life example, this is what they were left with and saw. And to make the numbers add up, we need to go down to a test, two month testing mode. So our target failure rate, um, one times 10 to the minus two, which is a risk reduction factor of 100, right on the borderline between SIL1 and SIL2. And when we crunched our numbers, we said that our achieved failure rate was just a little bit less frequent than the target. And we're looking at less frequent is better. More frequent is not better. And based on our achieved failure rate, we've got an achieved SIL based on failure rate, which is SIL2. And then we look at our hardware fault tolerance and based on our hardware fault tolerance, we go with the lowest number here, which is one. Um, and that gives us a hardware fault tolerance of still one, which, which meets our requirement. Now, what we need to do is we need to consider both sides of the coin. So we need to consider the average probability of failure on demand. And we need to consider the hardware fault tolerance and the chain is only as strong as its weakest link, and that is the hardware fault tolerance at SIL1. So that's what our overall claim is. Okay. So we've now had a look at our system and, and how good it needs to be. So what can affect failure probability? System architecture, we've also already talked about redundancy. <laughs> proof test interval, we can see that I lowered the proof test interval from a year to every two months, and, and that made us achieve the failure rate that we needed. Uh, Mean time to repair, how long does something take to uh, to to get sorted out after we've found that it's broken? Um, it doesn't usually have a significant effect on our calculations unless we get right down to, say, monthly testing, which I have seen. Um, and we're talking in, in a matter of hours, and, and that really does make a difference. Whereas if we're testing once a year, once every two years, um, even taking two shifts, to 12 hour shifts to repair something isn't really a problem. And um, diagnostic coverage, um, that can affect your failure probability um, depending on how you set up your smart instruments. It's all well and good buying uh, an all singing, all dancing um, sensor. But if you don't program it to, to do the all singing, all dancing, then it won't. And, and so you can't claim as much coverage. So, you know, use it wisely. Um, proof test coverage is something that gets forgotten about, and it's something that the HSA are pretty hot on at the moment. Um, it's generally related, their, their issue is generally related to people using manufacturer's failure rate data. And um, if you use manufacturer's failure rate data straight out of the tin, um, then it will get questioned and when you look at your product, your equipment safety manuals that you buy when you get silver a kit, um, they will have different tests described in them and they will give you a proof test coverage. So it's, it's a number to be aware of. We also need to look at systematic capability. It's not really an issue for us. Our system is SIL1, but if we needed, say, a SIL3 target and we were going to use this particular bit of kit, this sensor. What we can find is that actually it's only good for SIL2. It's good for SIL3 when there's redundancy there. So you've got to be really careful when you're specifying these things. It's all part of um, making sure that you achieve your required risk reduction. So has a LARP been achieved then? So we had a risk reduction target of 10,000 to bring us down to a likelihood of once in 100,000 years. And if you remember the big red triangle, the guidance states that the risk should be reduced to broadly acceptable, one in a million, so far as is reasonably practicable. So we're saying, but well, we don't think it's reasonably practicable to do that. Um, so how can we determine whether we should provide additional risk reduction or not? And we'll use this little equation here, the implied cost of averting the fatality. So um, the HSE had a bit of a study done by um, a company called Amy Vectra quite a while ago, and uh, it's, 
It's a significant piece of work. It's really detailed. But the bit that you need to know about for something that we're looking at is this bit. Um, and so we have a cost of implementing a measure and we need to multiply it by a gross disproportionation factor. And this is part of the argument saying that cost benefit analysis alone is insufficient. We need to show that it isn't just cost beneficial, not cost beneficial to implement something. It's grossly disproportionate to spend that amount of money to reduce the risk further. Um, and that gross disproportionation factor varies. It varies based on uh, where you are on the big red triangle. So if you're up at the top of the big red triangle, then the gross disproportionation factor is quite high, maybe around 10. If you're right at the bottom of the big red triangle, then it might be one or two. And I've used um, three in my calculation. And there's a reason for that, but it is described in the uh, in the documentation, so I won't go into it. Um, the estimated lifetime of plant in their example in the Amy Vector report, they use 20 years. And I'm going to stick with this. So really, what, it might not be the estimated lifetime of the plant, but um, what we're particularly interested in is the useful life of the equipment. So um, when we are looking at functional safety and safety in terms of limits in particular, they are assuming that we have a more or less constant failure rate. And if it's difficult to describe, but if you can imagine the bathtub curve that is quite popular in, in reliability engineering, uh, when you get to the end of the bathtub curve, the, the failure rate is exponential. And so we can't use that fossil because we, we need a, a fairly constant, fairly constant failure rate. So we're going to assume 20 years here, and that might be that you can buy a piece of kit that lasts 20 years, or you can overhaul it, um, or it might be that it lasts 10 years and you have to replace it. The delta PLL is the change in the potential loss of life. And what we're looking to do is we are looking to reduce the risk of five fatalities in 100,000 years to five fatalities in 1 million years and so what we end up with is a delta PLL of 4.5 times 10 to the minus 5. What we're interested in is saying how much does our risk reduction measure cost and what risk benefit do we get? So we have our cost of risk reduction measure. Now, I've chosen three arbitrary values here, 1,000 to 10,000 month values, and the implied cost of averting a fatality from, from implementing it is. Um, and you can see for a cost of 100, uh, of 1,000, sorry, to, to implement a risk reduction measure, that would mean that the implied cost of averting a fatality would need to be 2.78 million before it's grossly disproportionate to implement that that risk reduction measure. And you can see from note one there that back in 2019, when I did some work around this, the statistical cost of a human life was around 1.8 million. So that says that if the risk reduction measure costs a thousand pounds, you need to do it. However, when you look at a risk reduction measure that costs 10,000 pounds, then it would be grossly disproportionate at 27.78 million, 27.8 million. Um, and so if it's not really worth spending an extra £10,000 to reduce the risk down from 1 in 100,000 to 1 in 1 million. So as per note 3 there, you can conclude that it's highly unlikely that further risk reduction is reasonably practicable. Now, this statistical cost of a human life, you used to be able to get from the Bank of England. There was a particular web page that they, they had on there. It's it's been removed. I don't know where it's gone. Um, and I've had a look uh, around this subject and looked at the government's green book and references off to the Department of Transport. Nowhere can I find an actual number to say what it is now, but apparently it's two million. So the numbers here are a little bit out of date, but they're they're not too far away. So some conclusions then. So safety instrument systems, I think, and I think we've proved that, are a valid method of achieving a lab. 
either on their own or in conjunction with other risk reduction measures. And that's what we've done in this case. We've used other risk reduction measures to help us along the way and reduce our burden. <clears throat> the more risk reduction required, the more rigorous the design of the SIS and hence more paperwork. As I've said, it's really paperwork heavy as functional safety. Reducing risk to broadly acceptable levels is not always reasonably practicable. And I can remember sitting in HAZOPS years ago where somebody said, oh no, we can't reduce the risk any further than that. It's just not worth it. Um, but nobody ever made an argument, but this, this is the argument here. So to avoid undertaking a cost benefit analysis on each design and doing this each time, it's useful to set tolerability parameters. So when we looked at reducing the risk to one to 100,000 years, that was us setting a tolerability parameter. And in layer of protection analysis, we use something called a tolerable mitigated event likelihood. And that is to say that if this dangerous occurrence can occur any more frequently than our tolerable mitigated event likelihood, the risk is intolerable to us as a company. So that, that's set out corporate level. Um, although the proposed design solution achieves the required risk reduction, as I said, testing every two months is, is just not practicable. Um, and, and your plant manager is likely to be very upset if you come up with a design like that. So the design will probably need some redundancy. And what we may have is we may have a couple of valves in series that both shut, um, but we only need one of them to shut. For, uh, for the hazard to be avoided. And we may also have uh, a redundant transmitter where we vote them, perhaps one out of two. And, and that would give us um, that would give us better redundancy and a better design and would likely uh, alleviate our proof testing goal of two months and we could maybe extend it out to six months or perhaps a year. Um, one other thing we could do is we could buy better equipment. Um, Silver rated equipment used to be very expensive. It's not as much now. It's it's kind of a mainstream thing. Um, so it doesn't usually cost that much more. But um, although you there, there is always a temptation to use your existing kit that you've got on your plant, and we're, we're making a modification here, so there is existing kit. Um, there's always a temptation to do that, and there'll always be the argument comes up saying, well, why do we need to buy some more? Um, we've already got some. Well, this is what it is. If you buy a silver rated kit, it's better. It has a lower failure rate than standard kit. And it, again, it, it reduces the burden of the testing goal and may, may allow you to, to extend it. And I think the most important conclusion is number six. It's if you're in doubt, ask for expert support. Um, functional safety is like a rabbit warren. Once you go down, you can get lost very easily. Um, and I think if you, it's something that the HSE are quite hot on, and, uh, and it's easy to get wrong as well. It's not difficult, but you've got to know it. You've got to know what the rules are. So that's me. Uh, I've issued some uh, some stuff here for for further reading. There's some some really good um, content on these. This this second one down is a better report that I mentioned. Um, there's quite a lot of information on 61508.org, 61508 Association. Um, and there's some good guidance from CDOIF as well that's uh, that's worth a read as well if you've got to deal with uh, safety instrumented systems. So there we go. Any questions? Please ask away. Uh, right. I think the best way to manage questions will be if people could type them in the chat box at the bottom right hand corner of the screen. I'm sorry, I should have mentioned that at the beginning of the talk, but uh, it slipped my mind. Um, copies of uh, Nick's slides are available as a PDF. If you'd like to email me, I can send you a copy. Uh, and I have been recording this lecture and this will go on our YouTube channel uh, in a few days. So uh, it will all be available for easy reference. Um, while we're waiting for any questions in the chat box, I think one of the questions I'd like to ask Nick is, how do people generally react to 
uh, implementing safety measures. The, the reason I ask is we had a talk last month as part of the lecture competition from a, a guy who'd been out to India trying to do some installations in India. Uh, he had some uh, horrendous slides of uh, people balancing on dubious looking scaffolding and no safety harnesses and all sorts of things. Do you find that people, well, especially in this country and I guess most of Europe are reasonably receptive to uh, to having safety measures installed? Uh, I think that there's, there's, there's a distinction between what I would call occupational safety, um, which is your slips, trips, falls, falling off scaffolds, stuff like that, and in your process safety. And, and what we're looking at here is part of process safety. I think that process safety generally, it comes from a corporate level. And so it's required by the engineering design standards and it tends to get followed on modifications that are done by design houses. What I do see very, very often, worryingly often, is operational plants in, in the UK and certainly top tier coma plants as well, um, do not follow their own guidance and do not implement things properly and they think that they're operating safely, and they're not. Um, so I guess in answer to your question, yeah, I find them ev everywhere. I think in, in the UK, there's, there's generally a, a better acceptance of safety, occupational safety measures, than there is process safety measures. Um, nobody ever argues with the safety advisor that tells somebody to hold the handrail when they walk down the stairs. But as a safety engineer, everybody argues with me. I can imagine because you probably cost more money than holding the <laughs> holding yes. the railings. <laughs> I think that's uh, exactly a, what it is. We've got a few questions here now. Uh, Alan Scholes asks, this is a, an intriguing one. If you were to apply a LARP to COVID prevention, how well would it fit the engineering model of acceptability? Funnily enough, uh, that is discussed in... Um, there's a, a paper from the London School of Economics. Um, and they, they've, they've used the, that, that kind of analysis. And, and I think what their argument is, is, is that this implied cost inverted fatality and this singular um, figure, this average figure of a, a, a statistical fatality cost um, is, is flawed and, and that it should be, um, it should be adjusted for um, for how long you've got left to live, quality of life, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, there, there is discussion, and, and in particular on, on, you know, big sort of governmental decisions, there's discussion in the, the government's green book on, on this kind of approach, on on uh, on how you make sort of dis big decisions like that, or policy decisions based on cost and, and likely fatalities. So this, I don't think, is directly applicable to it, but. You can see where the background is. Mm -hmm. I just realised we'd had the same question twice. Um, anybody else got any questions? Uh, if you wish to unmute yourselves, there's a, a button at the bottom on the bottom on the left hand side of the screen to mute, or you can just hold the space bar down. No, anybody, any further questions? I think they've all gone to sleep. So, so I, I have Sue, but I'm, I'm, I'm in the middle of typing. So, oh. um, I mean, I, I can go through it, I, I suppose, uh, um, just talk it through. Is that okay? Okay, Stuart. Yeah. Okay. Well, so I, I've got halfway through writing. You started the talk with a description of a design change and the requirement to int introduce uh, new safety measures added retrospectively to an existing design a maintenance regime and maybe for and i think you mentioned a 30 year old plant a 30 plus year old plant um but 30 plus years ago the alarc approach was probably nowhere near as exact as now so we're talking about existing plants and and adding um alarc as as as, as you described it um to existing plants now you know <laughs> 
existing plants won't have the same kind of safety, maybe safety and maintenance regimes as 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 LR is, is defined. So how how do you approach existing plants where there are any were there any design changes that are required? Um, uh, in, in, in the example you gave, uh, where, where, so where the, do people stand with? So, for example, on on uh, process plant, it, it's good practice to review your hazard studies every five years, and so there should be a, a sort of a continuous assessment of where you are and what your risk profile is. Um, and yeah, and, and, and that, that's that, that, and that's done, but but not not to this, perhaps to the same extent as what you're describing, it, because all the, all the maintenance regimes are in place and and everything has been uh, fine for the past thirty years. Uh, but that may not be safe in the sense that you're describing. No, so um, it it depends on what your what your risk profile is to start with, but but also when when you do your uh, periodic hazard study refreshing um you may identify that um, you know either your corporate values have changed or, or you're being pushed by the hse to, to reduce risk even further which is a, a typical action of the hse and that's, that's their job is to to push for risk reduction all the time uh, and i guess it, it's down uh, again to this um this cost benefit analysis and and um, the gross disproportionation factor um so um, is it reasonably practicable for you to implement those changes? So you've got to look at um, not just the cost of the equipment, but the cost of implementing it, maintaining it, um, installing it, overhauling it, and, and all the rest of the, the, the capacity that, that goes with it, and, and 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 look at the cost on that. But you know, yes, if if it's been I can't imagine a plant that's been operating for 30 years without any modifications. Put it that way. There's always something. There's always something. In it. And again, you know, when you're doing your periodic hazard refreshing, hazard study refreshing, that's when you should be identifying these things and, and making an assessment. So I think the, the approach is, is the same. The numbers might be different, but the approach is the same. Uh, we have a question in the chat box. How can failure rate data be considered credible and justifiable for SIL equipment? Right, okay. Um, so uh, there's, there's two main sources of failure rate data. That is the manufacturer's <clears throat> generic failure rate data. And what you've got to remember is that when manufacturers test their kit, their, their aim in life is to sell their equipment. So their failure rates have got to be as good as possible. And so the conditions in which they are tested are pristine. It is very unlikely that your plant is a pristine location with no dust, no vibration, no muck, um, nobody's made a mistake um, implementing something, there's no stress on the pipework, et cetera, et cetera. So using manufacturer's failure rate data directly without any consideration is is um it's it's a road to hardship put it that way and, uh, what i find is that um generic failure rate data and, and you can find this from various databases such as a reader Paradip, um exeter have, have their own stuff um there is some online such as uh, self-safe data from exeter which i generally point my clients to and the the difference between the two is about two orders of magnitude failure rate so uh, your generic failure rate data is generally fails you know, 100 times more often than, than your manufacturer's stuff. So I tend to tell people to increase the manufacturer's failure rate data by an order of magnitude. And, and if you're looking after your plant, then, then that should be about where you're sitting, to be honest. Okay, we have another question here. In a LARP point of view, is a passive barrier preferable or an active barrier? Passive, every time. It's a short and sweet answer. Um, somebody with an ID of M239106, um, they uh, have question flashed up on the screen and then disappeared again. Uh, do you want to unmute yourself and ask it? Hi, Nick, it's Adrian. Hello. Hello. 
Go ahead. Um, Nick, um, how can sill and hazards be better managed and integrated? Should we always do hazards, then sill, then loop, and then go back to the hazards? Um, so, in your hazard, you'd be looking at deviations from design intent, and um, your sill rated system would be something that you you um, identify as as a safeguard, and, and some people take credit in their HAZOP for the, the risk reduction provided by the safeguards and some don't. So the, some people do the risk ranking and establish a risk profile without any safeguards. So how bad is it without any protection? Then you look at your protection and then you maybe take the, or where, where you've got significant risk where you're looking at say um, uh, serious injuries or fatalities, then you would maybe take that to, uh, to a cell analysis. So, Loper, uh, QRA, um, fault tree, uh, risk graph, you know, there's, there's various different means out there. And then you would look at all your protection layers and establish whether they're as good as they need to be or not. I, I don't think there's a requirement once you've done that to then necessarily go back to the hazard and do it again. Um, I think that when you, when you come round to your periodic refresher, you know, that's when you should be saying, well, I did have this system installed last time. How has it performed? Yeah. yeah using real data, yeah. Yes. So you should, any anybody who installs something like this on, on their site should be, as part of the functional safety standard requirements, should be collecting um, site-specific data and looking at the performance of the system. And in fact, there's, there's a specific functional safety assessment, a stage four functional safety assessment. That's the whole purpose of that is to look at how that piece of silver paper, that, that, that trip is is performing in, in reality. You know, is it, is it meeting the requirements? Is it meeting expectations? Mm. Yeah, just back to the sales then, really. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Do we have any more questions from anybody? Looks not. Okay, well, I'd like to thank Nick very much for uh, leaving the beach to come and talk to us all about <laughs> functional safety. I guess My it's pleasure. something that uh, as long as it's doing its job, it's not uh, heard very much about. I suppose we get to hear about it when things go disastrously wrong, which is a shame. So uh, just to reiterate, if anybody would like a copy of Nick's slides, please get in touch with me. Um, the video will be up on our YouTube channel and I'll circulate the uh, address to those on our mailing list. If you'd like to go on our mailing list to be made aware of future lectures and uh, other bits of news, please contact me uh, and I will add you. So uh, I think it only remains for me to say thank you to everybody for attending uh, and let me get back to his pina colada. <laughs> Good night.